So welcome, Dr. Bernia. Thank you. Is that correct? Uh, pronunciation? Bernia, yeah. Bernia? Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. Nope, no problem. Um, um, again, um, thank you for being with us here today. Mm -hmm. um, following the uh, um, interview questions this evening, um, we uh, will have the opportunity for you to make some closing remarks. Um, all board members will be asking you questions in a round robin format this evening. And um, we've had the opportunity to review your resume in detail. Please tell us uh, how your experiences and qualifications have prepared you to be the next superintendent of Wald Lake Schools. Certainly. Uh, well, before I get going with that, Mr. President, members of the board, good evening. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for staying up late tonight. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, as you mentioned, my name is uh, John Bernia. Uh, currently, I am the Chief Academic Officer for Warren Consolidated Schools. Uh, Warren Con is a district east of here. Uh, we service parts of Sterling Heights, Warren, and Troy. Uh, we have just under 13,000 students, 12, high, or 12 elementary schools, 12 high schools, that would be, uh, that would be alarming. 12, 12 elementary schools, uh, four middle schools, uh, three high schools. This might start, be starting to sound a little familiar to you. Um, because we're, we're pretty similar in size. Uh, we have an alternative high school. Uh, we have a math and science program for our middle school and a middle school uh, and a math and science program for our high school kids. That's a consortium school that services some of the top performing students from around Macomb County uh, and has been for more than 30 years. We have a middle school and high school performing arts program. Our performing arts program uh, is nationally recognized uh, and we have uh, the Career Preparation Center. Uh, we, we host 22 CTE programs in Warren Consolidated Schools uh, and most of them are housed at our CPC facility. So my role in all of that is to really oversee the day-to-day -day operations so all the principals report directly to me. I also lead the Office of Curriculum and Instruction so our Executive Director of Curriculum, uh, Administrators for Assessment and Continuous Improvement and English Language Learner Services uh, report directly to me along with the coaches and consultants and folks that we have that work for them. Uh, I oversee our three special education supervisors, so I serve as kind of a quasi special ed director in Warren Con right now. Uh, pupil services reports directly to me as does public relations. So I, I oversee a lot of the operations of our district. I've been on the superintendent's team. I've, I'm coming into my seventh year in this role. So I'm on the superintendent's team, which gives me a whole host of opportunities. Um, so I'm on the district negotiating team with the Warren Education Association and the Warren Administrators Association. Uh, I work with the business office on our budget development, some of our projections and things like that because of my involvement with people services. And for the past, I was on the 2016 bond team. Uh, our voters approved a bond uh, last May, so I'm on the 2022 bond team. Uh, we just kicked off that work, so I'm pretty excited about that. And then there's some other smattering of work that I do that I'm sure we'll get into uh, as time goes, kind of that other duties as assigned that fall into school leadership from time to time. So I'm sure we'll talk about that this evening. So I, I think that that experience over the past six years uh, has prepared me pretty well to, to come here and serve as your superintendent. I, again, as I mentioned in the outset, our district and your district are similar in size. Uh, I think similar in diversity. I think similar in core values. I mean, we're about all kids, you're about every child. So I think you're gonna see some overlap in some of my answers, at least I hope you do, if I do my job correctly tonight. So uh, I'm a, I just finished my doctoral studies. So I uh, gave my presentation in early July. So I've been Dr. Bernia for a few weeks now. I'm still getting used to that. Uh, so I, I respond to either, um, but uh, I'm, I'm still making that transition. And before I was chief academic officer, I was a principal at Carleton Middle School in, in Warren Con for a year. Prior to that, I started my career in Lake Orion Community Schools. So I was a teacher and an assistant principal and a principal in Lake Orion before I made the move to Warren Con. Uh, in that time in Lake Orion, I was the 2015 NASSP Digital Principal of the Year. Uh, one of three winners of that award. So I got to travel the country and talk education everywhere. So I have a little national exposure uh, to the world of education, which I think also has me well prepared to take on this role. And, and then in, in my personal life, uh, my wife Jen and I just celebrated our 16th anniversary last week. And uh, we are the proud parents of Avery, who is 10 and going into the fifth grade, and Micah, who is six and going into the first grade, and got the teacher she wanted for first grade. So it's, we have a happy house. <laughs> 
uh, at least for the next couple of days anyways. So we're, we're pretty excited about that. I'm here tonight because my cover letter says that I'm interested in serving as a superintendent of Wald Lake. Uh, you are a premier district. Uh, I've been a longtime fan of Wald Lake. I think we'll get into that as we talk a little bit tonight. Um, I've had the opportunity to be here for different conferences and getting to know a few people. And uh, I have some professional relationships with um, some of the leaders who uh, were once in Wald Lake. I'm sure we'll get into that too. So I'm a longtime fan of your district and your work. Uh, so I was really thrilled when this opportunity came up and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thanks for having me. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, our, your next question will be asked by um, Vice President, uh, Mr. Siegler, and then we will proceed in order from there. Sure. Mr. Dr. Siegler. Thank you. Dr. Bernier, please share an example of a time you have led a sustained multi-year improvement initiative. Be specific regarding the situation, the task at hand, your specific role, and the outcome. Sure. So I came on board uh, in this role in 2016, right as that 2016 bond was really kicking off. And so in that 2016 bond, what we were doing and a big focus area for us was security. So we were doing a lot of hardware upgrades. Uh, so we made ma massive improvements to our cameras. We expanded our camera access, secure entryways into our buildings. And we really took, and took major steps forward as a school system in the infrastructure of our safety and security. And that really was a lot of the work for 16, 17, and then the early part of 2017. And, and then unfortunately, the Parkland shooting happened, which I'm sure everybody remembers. And what, as an outgrowth of that, as we started to debrief that with our leaders, what became clear was that we were doing the work on the infrastructure side of things, but we weren't doing enough on the training side of things. And we weren't doing enough to make people feel prepared and equipped. So I went to work, we have a director of security and crisis management. So he and I went to work together to do some research on best practices. And there was a body of research that was out there. Unfortunately, these tragic events have happened enough to where there is research out there about this now. So we did some homework. And as a result of that, decided to initiate a, a staff-wide training plan. So it started that May where we had a staff-wide ALICE training and introductory training. And then it followed up in August where we had a second training. So my role in that was to work with our director of security and crisis management, law enforcement, our administrators, our teacher leaders on what that training would look like to make sure that we were well positioned. But with any good training plan, an isolated training is not going to move the needle. So what we had to do is really think through phase two. So we took all the lessons learned and really started to apply them to that second phase of, okay, now how can we, what are the next steps? And so we identified some further training needs for our leaders, was really an outgrowth of that. Right around that same time, our director of security and crisis management was, uh, he was in the Air Force Reserves and he got recalled. So I was the director of security and crisis management for a short time. So I was the one leading those trainings. I was leading those tabletop exercises with, with our leaders and really learning and growing with them as we continued that conversation. The next phase really got into how we could improve our drills. By then, our director of security and crisis management had returned, and we were able to really start thinking through what would good drills look like. Now, that's a diverse group of people to pull, pull together for drills because we were talking with teachers and administrators and folks from law enforcement and then our central office administrative team. And there's, we all have the same mission to, to provide safety, but we all have very differing perspectives, right? The perspective of someone in law enforcement on a crisis situation is different than an elementary teacher. So my role was to kind of facilitate that and listen to everybody and work together on how we could improve our drills. Around that time, our director of security and crisis management um, got an ex incredible job offer. So he ended up uh, leaving our system. And so then I had to lead the process to recruit and hire a new director of security and crisis management. And we brought him on board. He, he's doing an exceptional job for us. And our training process and our training program has continued to evolve. We've developed this system of training exercises and then feedback loops so that we can continue to grow. Last spring, we received a letter from the Macomb County Emergency Management uh, commending us for our work. And just last week, um, you, you could still find it, I think, on the WXYZ website, but just last week, we had more than 100 teachers take place or uh, take part in our latest training exercise, which is uh, for staff only. 
uh, but it's a little bit more intense and it's a little bit more rigorous. And we received such positive feedback on that. Our work now is to kind of think through what the next stages of that are. So the security crisis management work that we've done has really progressed over years and through phases. Uh, and my role has kind of evolved and changed um, from supporting the process to overseeing the process to directly leading the process throughout. Uh, but it's something that I'm pretty proud of. And, and I think that overall, uh, when, when the horrible tragedy in Oxford happened, one of, the most thi one of the things we were most proud of as a central team was that our administrators and our staff was coming back to us and saying, we know who to call in an emergency. We have protocols in place. We, we have training in place. And so we're still trying to get better and we're still trying to navigate that together. But it is an area where I think we've made some tremendous progress and, and something I'm really proud of. Thank you. Uh, next question from Secretary, Mr. Peterson. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening. <clears throat> Tell us about your experiences maintaining a focus on student learning while also managing a district that is declining in both enrollment and revenues. Right. As I was studying up and getting prepared for tonight, there were so many times where I felt like your story was our story. So we went from, we, we had 13 elementary schools when I came on board, one had just closed. So we went from 14 elementary schools to 12 elementary schools like you did due to some of those same, same situations. A challenge that we had that you didn't was that when I came on board in 2016, we had schools that had been identified as priority schools. So these are some of the bottom performing elementary schools in the state. So while our enrollment is declining and while our resources are being reduced, we also have this academic crisis where we're underperforming for some of our youngest students. And so what we had to do was engage in a process and, and really do some very important strategic plan work to really identify, okay, what, what resources do we have and what are we actually doing in our classrooms? So it, it really was an exercise that, in, that engaged everyone was part of the process. And by making everyone the part of the process, I think people became more engaged in it because people are more likely to support what they help to build. And so as they started, as our teachers started to engage in that process with us, and as we started to identify those high leverage strategies and those district areas where we really wanted to focus our energy and focus our work on the academic side of things, we ended up with a pretty strong strategic plan. And we were able to identify some major, we call them in Warren Con, we call them the big buckets. You know, so it's our, it's our PLC process, it's our MTSS process, it's how we support students, it's quality instruction, and then it's what we call our student support network. So how students feel connected to their school, how safe they feel, how supported they feel, uh, and how focused we are on the whole child. And really, once we developed that strategic plan, I, I think it was important in, in a few ways. Number one, by developing that plan and sticking with it, we were able to engage in a process that really improved outcomes for our students. And so we were, uh, in 2019, recognized by the Mackinac Center of all places for some of the largest growth that any school district around the state had seen. And, and I think that that process has served us very, very well. I can tell you five of our seven secondary schools are have returned to where they were in, uh, on, as we went into the pandemic. So our, our PSAT, SAT scores have returned to that and it's by sticking to that process. So we've been re very, very disciplined uh, and that's one of my roles in, in our district is to, is to be the, really they call me the initiative czar because anytime there's an idea for a new initiative, I have to meet and see how that fits into our strategic process and if it does or if it doesn't. And a lot of times I say no, not because it's not a good idea, but because it gets in the way of the process that we've always agreed to. And I, I think the strength of our system has been that we don't come up, we don't have a new central office initiative every year. We rather, we just have this ongoing process of improvement and I think that served us very, very well. Thank you. Uh, next question uh, from Treasurer Mrs. Kaplan. Using specific examples, please tell us how you maintain visibility and accessibility to the board, staff, parents, and community groups. How would you ensure this happens as our next superintendent? 
I think in school leadership, visibility is key. I think that's one of the most important lessons I've learned in my work, uh, being out there and being visible and being accessible for everyone and, and really truly listening. I think are, are critical leadership attributes, and, and I think I, I'm good at it, and I continue to get better at it. Uh, real specifically, you know, if I can have a, if we have to have a meeting, and we can meet in the school as opposed to central office, I'll go to the school, um, so I can be there and walk around for a few minutes and see the teachers and see the students. Uh, I think that that that's a good way that that you can approach that. I, I think that. Um, from my perspective, you know, we, we try to attend, I try to attend as many events as I can. Our superintendent and I uh, have it on our calendars. We're going to attend all of our open houses this year for every single site uh, in our district so that we can shake hands and talk to parents at least for a few minutes before we go off to the next one. Uh, and, and that's something that I'm really committed to, uh, you know, sporting events, productions, art shows. You know, I make it a point to be at all of those things. Uh, in the winter, uh, in Warren Con, I lead our kindergarten recruiting. Uh, so there's a stretch in February where I'm out almost every night uh, talking to different community groups uh, about our kindergarten and early childhood programs. And then for us, it, like I'm sure for you, when you get to the spring, you're out almost every night with, with one recognition or another. Uh, and I enjoy those events. So I, I think it's about being there. I think it's about being visible. But I think it's also about being present while you're there. It's not just it's not just walking in the door and walking back out. Uh, but it's it's really being there and it's really engaging and it's really listening. When it comes to the board, I, I will tell you that as your superintendent, if I'm fortunate enough to be your candidate, I, I can I can assure you that I will work tirelessly to be accessible to all of you. And my goal would be that when you go to Oakland schools or an event that the MASB puts on or anywhere else, you will say our superintendent is incredibly engaged, incredibly accessible. If we need something, he gets it to us quickly. That's going to be one of my goals and one of my commitments to the seven of you. And, and so I think that that's just uh, an important point of pride for me. And, and I think that if you talk to our employees or talk to our staff that I work with now in our district, they would tell you if I call him or text him, he always answers and he's always the same guy, whether it's 9.48 p.m. or 5.45 a.m. He, he's ready and he's ready to help. And that's just the energy and kind of the passion I bring to my work. So that, that's a, a big point of pride for me. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from trustee Mrs. Dunn. Tell us about a challenge you've experienced in bringing a diverse group of people to consensus on a difficult issue. How did you provide leadership and what was the final outcome? So I shared, when I came on board, we, we had these three priority schools in, in 2016 and shortly thereafter, uh, the governor signed the K-3 reading legislation, uh, which would have retained students in third grade if they didn't meet a certain cut score on the M-STEP. And when you look at it on paper, that was really potentially catastrophic for the kids who go to our schools. I think an important piece of context for Warren Khan, 40% of our kids are either current or former English language learners. So not only do we have priority schools, we also have a language barrier with some of our students and some additional supports that we need there. So the, the K-3 legislation happens and we pulled together a group and it, it was a diverse group. It, it was uh, central office folks and literacy specialists and teachers and union leaders and principals. And, and this diverse group got together and, and we were gonna try to attack this problem and figure out what our response was going to be and and we had to figure out you know what was our screener going to be and what were our documents going to look like and what was our approach to parent meetings going to be and and how were we going to analyze our data we had to wrestle with all of those things but in addition to that in 2016 uh, our district had gone into deficit two years earlier and our employees in 2016 were taking massive concessions in their paycheck and so at that time, it is very, very difficult to add resources. It's very difficult to spend money when your employees are taking massive concessions like ours were. So there's a lot of different interests at the table when we sat down to lead the group. I think the success of it came from arriving at consensus around the idea that we didn't want this to happen to our kids. We didn't want a situation to happen where the state stepped between the school and the parent and making a retention decision. 
And so we were very, very adamant that we didn't want this for our students. And we were also big believers that this could be important work, not only on the third grade reading front, but on the priority school front. So we engaged in a, I, I think it was a very healthy debate. There was conflict uh, and we navigated through that conflict, but I think that that very healthy debate and that very healthy conflict led us to really positive results. So we, had a, we have a plan and that plan is, is so widely regarded. It's been uh, recommended by the Macomb Intermediate School District to some other districts in Macomb County. Uh, the, the results have shown themselves to, to be good. Uh, in the first year of the legislation, and I think it's important to remember the first year of this legislation two years ago was when we were really fighting the pandemic and students had been out of school and school had been remote. 94% uh, of our students passed with flying colors with, with no problems at all. 3% had good cause exemptions. So 97% of our kids came through just fine. And the 3% of our kids that were identified by the state, we knew who, even I knew who they were. To show how good our system is and to show how strong our data analysis was, it went all the way through the system that we knew who these students were and we could make good judgments and work with their parents. Last year, in the test that we just took in the spring, 95% of our kids came through with flying colors, 3% had good cause exemption, so 98% of our kids made it through. And in addition to that, you know, it's a good outcome for our students, but it's also been a really good outcome for our staff. So the positive relationship that we were able to build around this system and around this process engaged our teachers in such a way that just a couple of weeks ago in early August, we hosted a meeting at the district level so the, the kids that are going to be in third grade this year were in kindergarten when the pandemic first happened. So they missed the last half of March, April, and May, and, and June of their education in kindergarten. And pushed by this group to identify the most important months of a child's education, I, I can't tell you that that's the answer, but it's, it's in my top, it's in my top group because of the foundational skills that happen right there. And so the, that group of kids is gonna be in third grade and they're behind. And it's not their fault they're behind, but they are. Because circumstances have created a, a scenario where the, their data is just not where we want it at this time. And so a couple of weeks ago, to show you how positive our working relationship has, has become, I called a meeting with all the third grade teachers in the district and our literacy team, they attended, and we had a two day workshop where we really identified what, what, our, what our changes are gonna be in classroom practice, what resources we need. And, and I'm very confident going into the school year that this is gonna work and, and that this is gonna benefit our students because of the collaborative way that we've gone about this and because people are invested in the process that they helped to build. So I'm really excited to see how this turns out, but I'm very optimistic about how it's gonna turn out. And I, so I think that the third grade reading law work has been good for our students, but I think it's also been good for our staff because I think they're working together and, and in a tighter way. Thank you. Our next question is from trustee Ms. Van Leeuwen. Please explain opportunities you have had working and collaborating in diverse, multicultural and inclusive settings. Sure, I, I, before I get to my, my professional work, um, you, you know, folks that know me or folks that follow me on social media know that I come from a very diverse family. So uh, navigating diversity and, and diverse voices at the table is something that I experience at dinner every night um, and, and is something that I really embrace. And so that's something I carry with me every day. And the importance of diversity because of my family is something that is just critically important to me. Uh, Warren Consolidated Schools, a lot like Wald Lake. You know, we're one of the more diverse school districts in Southeast Michigan. 40% of our students are English language learners, as I mentioned a minute ago. Um, we have a large Arabic population that, that attends our schools. Um, they're Chaldean. Uh, and so we've had to go to work with the Chaldean Community Foundation, which has been one of our really good strategic partners, to make sure that we get information to our students. So the Chaldean Foundation has been a great partner to host events for us just a couple just last week we held a welcome back to school night so that families could come to the foundation and predominantly these are families that don't speak english and they can come to the foundation they can get their questions answered they can find out about registration bus stops who they call you know when they can go pick up their schedule if they're a high school student sports information we host this event in partnership with them so in addition to 
the traditional registration events we host at our schools, we host this one there too. Uh, when we have our kindergarten nights, I talked about recruiting kindergartners. We have our kindergarten roundup meeting. Two nights later, we have an event at the Chaldean Community Foundation broadcast in their native language, telling them about our kindergarten programs. So it's been a really good strategic partnership to ensure that we're getting information to the families that need it in the language that they speak so that they can feel more comfortable. Because what we are finding is that language barrier was prohibiting them from asking questions that they had. So we, we really had to go to work to try to support that and, and to really make sure that that was accessible. Another group for us, uh, we, we've seen a surge of a Bengali population that's moved into the south side of our district. And so we have been working uh, for two years to identify uh, some partners and some folks that can help us with translation service and can help us with outreach. And I'm so excited that we finally found our candidate. Uh, we just hired uh, someone who's going through the onboarding process, and that's going to be a game changer for us with the Bengali community because it's going to do the same thing that our translators and our community partners do for us with, uh, with our Arabic community. So I'm really excited about that. I think another thing we do uh, towards diversity, we have a group that we call our faith-based community partners. So these are religious organizations or community organizations, and we bring them together uh, a couple of times a year. We give them a presentation about one thing or another. Uh, the last one was about student mental health and well-being, just so they could understand our strategic work, and then they can connect it to themselves. It's forged a lot of good partnerships between us and some organizations, because an emerging population for us is our Muslim population. And I'll close with this. Uh, I'll close with this before we move on to the next question. A couple of years ago, uh, I was approached by one of our principals, who said that um, she had been approached by a seventh grade boy and he, it was Ramadan, and he was in that stage of seventh grade boyhood where he needed to eat every eight to nine minutes, which is normal. I went through it myself, and I, you know, so he said that the cafeteria was really hard for him. So he asked if it'd be okay if he went to the media center at lunchtime, and she was gonna let him. She didn't have a problem with it. Well, one student turned into two, turned into five, turned into 10, turned into 120. So, I saw the principal, I asked her how it was going, she told me how it had turned into 120 students and, and how remarkable that was. And she said the, the young man who is kind of the, the guy that got this started, he's, he's feeling pretty empowered. And I said, good, that's what we want. We want our students to feel empowered. And she said, well, he'd like to talk to you about the school calendar. And I said, okay, okay, well. So he wrote me the nicest letter and, and it was so well done. And he wrote me the nicest letter about how in our school system, we take a day off for Good Friday, but we don't take a day off for the holiday of Eid, which is the Muslim holiday that concludes Ramadan. And so I went to his school. I asked him to come down to the office. I met with him. I explained to him the nuances of the school calendar and all the things that go into it and how there really wasn't much I could do for him at this time. But I, I, I looked at him across the table and I said, Inyit, I will never forget you and I will never forget that this happened. And so I took his letter and I put it in my folder. If I'm your choice, you'll get to know my folder. It's where I carry all my stuff. And his letter stayed in my folder for two years. And when we opened uh, the calendar up and when we opened negotiations to rework our school calendar a couple years ago, I pulled, his, I pulled that letter out and, and said very seriously, we have to do something about this. And so last year for the first time in Warren Consolidated Schools, we had a day off for Eid. And I called Inyet and uh, I asked his principal, he's now in high school, I called him and I asked his principal if, if he could set up a meeting with him and me and his parents. And can you imagine being a freshman in high school and getting called down to the principal's office with, for no apparent reason whatsoever? And then the, the principal's boss, the chief academic officer, walks in and sits down and I, I asked him if he remembered me. He did, I remembered him, his parents were there and I told him how he had changed the system and how he had advanced a conversation and how he had helped us grow a conversation around how we honor all of our kids. And so I, I think that that's, that's an example of my commitment to student voice, but it's also I think a commitment to diversity and, and how we're changing that conversation. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from trustee uh, Mrs. Casagrande. Let you finish your drink of water well, thank there. You. I appreciate well, that. I can finish that was, that writing out nice some notes. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Bernia, could you please describe how you have engaged and affirmed all staff members and please provide examples? Sure. So I, I think if you want to really understand the challenges or if you really want to do good work in school leadership, 
you have to listen to everybody because they all know something, right? The bus drivers are the first people that greet our kids in the morning, and they know they know how kids are feeling when they go to school. They're the last person that, that they see. You know, our, our custodians seem to know everything um, and, and really have a wealth of information. Uh, I, I was at our service center today meeting with our director of transportation, and when I was done, I went and stopped in our food service area and just talking to, talking to the food service employees about the things that they're thinking about and the service that they're trying to provide for our students. It was, number one, it was inspired because of how positive they were and how team-oriented they were, but it was a reminder of the good work that happens across our system. You, you know, so I'm, I'm known to go meet with the teachers. I'm known to spend a lot of time with our principals. I'm known as a listener in our system, but that extends to everybody. And I think that comes from a, an experience of mine. So before I was chief academic officer, I was a principal. And before I was a principal, I was an assistant principal. And before I was an assistant principal, I was a teacher. But my very first job in our profession, I was a school custodian when I was in college. I worked second shift in Romeo Community Schools. Uh, I was I was lovingly uh, tagged the floating custodian, which means they could send me anywhere they wanted to for any assignment at any time. Uh, so I, I, that experience taught me a lot about preparation. It taught me a lot about attention to detail, but it also taught me, I can tell you sincerely, there were times where I felt marginalized because that was my job. And I resolved when I when I started down the line of school leadership, I resolved to never, ever make anyone feel like I felt in those moments where I felt like no one was listening and, and I had information that I thought could help our school get better in, in one way or another. And so I, I have this drive that comes from that experience, but I also have this drive that comes from the fact that those people those folks that were my head custodian or my crew leader on the afternoon shift, they taught me so many important lessons and were so dedicated to our school and making sure it was clean and safe and ready for kids every day. And I, I can't tell you how much I learned from them about being prepared or attention to detail. And, and so because I valued them so much and I value the impact they had on me. I make sure I never, ever, ever make any of those people feel marginalized or less a member of the team. We're all a member of the team and none of us is more important than anybody else. We all have different roles on the team. You know, my role might be to make some of the bigger decisions, but that doesn't make me any more of a member of the team or any less of a member of the team. We're all members of the team. And that's, that's really my values, and, and that's what I'm going to bring to to you all as your superintendent, if I'm your choice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Bernia, um, how do you go about making decisions on controversial issues? And please give an example of a controversial issue um, you have experienced. Well, school leadership can be a contact sport, <laughs> as, as I'm sure... Uh, we, we've all experienced. And it might just be Warren Kahn, but our response to the COVID-19 pandemic seemed to please no one. Um, maybe that was just us. We couldn't seem to make anybody happy. But I, I can think about some things that I've done um, where it was time to make a move in one way or another. But the one, the one shining example that will be forever attached to my name in Warren Consolidated Schools is my decision uh, to recommend uh, and then to get the superintendent and board support to decentralize her early childhood programs. And that was a, a very, very, very controversial move uh, and is still not fully accepted by some folks. And I, I wanna tell you how it happened because uh, I think it's important. So when I came on board in 16, Warren Con opened an early childhood center in 2014. It was just, it was in a neighborhood just north of 15 Mile Road. Uh, and Warren Kine goes from about 17 and a half mile at our far north end to about 10 and a half mile on our far south end. We go from DeQuinder over to Shaner. That's really kind of our parameters. It's not exactly straight lines uh, because the folks that drew our district maps all those years ago, they just didn't draw straight lines. And so what we found when I was analyzing our data in 16, 17, when I first came on board, the kids that were participating in those programs only lived around the Early Childhood Center on 15 Mile Road. So we were not seeing kids leave the south side of our district or the far east side of our district or the far west side of our district and drive to that Early Childhood Center. 
in addition to that, the students who were going to our early childhood center were not necessarily enrolling in our kindergarten programs. So it was a double problem because they were becoming so used to driving themselves to school that they kind of shopped around for the school that seemed to feel the best. And they, it might have been a Warren Con school, but it might not have been. And if you're, again, back to those boundaries, which are not necessarily straight lines, in Macomb County, you have some schools. You know, we have, we have a high school. Cusno High School is less than five miles from a neighboring district high school in a pretty straight line. And so that's something that we had to wrestle with. So our, the, the problem became our early childhood center, it was good, and our programs were good, but they weren't serving all kids. They were only serving a few kids, and that was a problem. In addition to that, the students who were participating in those programs were not necessarily going to our kindergarten programs. So I studied the data, and in 1718, studied the data again. It was the same thing. So we had four years of data indicating that this was not working for all kids. So I went to the superintendent, and I shared the data, and I recommended to him that we use the classroom space that we had in our elementary schools and we decentralize and go to more of a neighborhood approach for our early childhood programs. And he... Well, he didn't fall out of his chair, but he really wasn't excited. And he said, this is very bold. And I, I said, I, I understand that, but I, I, if we want to, I want to build an early childhood program for all the kids that go to school here. I don't, I, this is only for one neighborhood. We've got this whole big district that needs us. So he let me present it to the cabinet, which I did. They had a similar reaction, but they ended up agreeing. And then I presented it to our board, and then I presented it to our union leaders, and then I presented it to our administrators, and then I started to present it, and then I helped present it to the staff of that school, and then I helped write the community letter, and then I helped develop the frequently asked questions that went along with it, and really kind of had my name all over it at this point. Um, and, and I can tell you sincerely it was very unpopular. I can tell you sincerely that uh, there were a lot of people that really pushed back against it. Um, I received no shortage of emails about all the districts that were opening early childhood centers. Uh, you folks made your announcement about your own early childhood center. I think every day for a week I got a different article with a picture of Ken Gutman smiling at me, um, telling me what a great idea this was. And it, and I, th I think it is. I I'm for this if it can work for the whole community. But in Warren Consolidated Schools, it wasn't working for the whole community. So we had to make this move. It's still not all the way popular. It's still not wholly accepted. But I can tell you that where we started, we had four transitional kindergarten classrooms that became five. That's now eight. We had five World of Four preschool cl classrooms that's become 12. So we've considerably grown our footprint in early childhood. Our early childhood special education program, ECSE, went from three classrooms to seven. And we've been able to build a real ECSE program with a staff that's dedicated just to those early childhood special education students, which is really outstanding. And, and so doing it the way that we've done it, yeah, it was, it was not widely accepted, but at the same time, it was the right move, and it did work for Warren Consolidated Schools. Now, I want to say something, because when I walk out of here tonight, I don't want to be painted as the guy that's against early childhood centers two weeks after you had your ribbon cutting, because <laughs> that's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is, if I am your superintendent, I'm going to apply what I learned in that situation, and I'm going to come back to you, and I'm going to report who's going to those programs. And you you are about every child. So you, as, as I understand it, based on the review that I've done of your district and the homework that I've done, you are about building that center for kids for all throughout Wald Lake Consolidated School District, right? Not just the kids that live around it. So that is a big lesson learned for me that I'm going to bring to this role. I'm going to report to you how it's going. And if I feel like it's not representative of all students, I'm going to empty the tank to try to make sure that we can create opportunities for kids for, from all over the district to attend those early childhood programs because I think that's your core value and I think that's what you're about. So I'm, I'm, I can't say that I'm as excited as you are. You've been on this since the ground floor, but I am excited about your early childhood center. It's state of the art and it's beautiful. And I'm excited to do that work with you and for you, but I, I think it's also important that you know that I have this experience that I really don't want to go through again, quite candidly. And I, it's something that I'm going to work really hard to apply the lessons learned from that experience. 
Thank you. Uh, our next question is from uh, Vice President, Mr. Siegler. Describe your knowledge and experience in using data to make informed decisions. Sure. So, say that once more. Perfect timing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> thanks. So I, I, I just shared, I, I just shared some, a, a data-driven decision. So let me take you in a different direction. Um, I, I enrolled in my doctoral program uh, shortly before my oldest daughter was born. And so I took the coursework and, um, and then I took some time off because I got drafted into this central office position. Uh, and then uh, my wife had a little bit of a health issue, so I had to take some time off. So when I got back into it and I was ready to do my work and, and do my independent work, I met with the chair of my committee and she said, John, tell me what you want to be an expert in because when this is done, you're gonna be an expert in something. What is that thing you wanna be an expert in? And I said, I really wanna be an expert in knowing if stuff works. In other words, in education, we're always coming up with something, whether it's a summer program or the decentralization of early childhood programs, or you know, we're always, there's always something going on. And I said, I wanna be an expert in knowing, did we get out of that what we wanted to get out of that? And she said, I think you should pursue an EDD in, in program evaluation. And I said, oh, okay. And so that, that's what I've really spent the last two years of every spare moment, you know, for a guy that has a kind of a big job and two young kids at home and, and you know, everything else that I have in my life, you know, all my free time has gone into learning about this and learning about how to study an issue and learning about how to properly do an analysis and do an evaluation of things so that we can find out if it really works. Uh, because that's, that's the kind of superintendent I want to be. You know, I, I want to be the kind of superintendent that when we bring you something, not only do we bring it to you and introduce you, that always feels good, but you know what feels better? When we come back and tell you that what we did worked. And, and so I, I think that that, you know, I know I'm taking your question kind of in a different, uh, kind of in a different direction. I think I gave you a specific example in the last one. Um, but I'm really driven to, to do that. So my doctoral study ended up being about a summer literacy program that, we're, that we run in our district. And the goal of that program, it, it is for, uh, it's an invitation-based program for our most struggling readers. And so we invite students that need that extra support and the goal of the program is to help them either maintain or grow in their reading level from spring to fall. And so that's what my analysis is about. Uh, and that sets us up, you know, now that we've done that initial legwork with our data warehouse and our data system, we can do that in a more ongoing way. So I'm excited to see the fruits of that as time goes on. Thank you. Our next question is um, from Secretary Mr. Peterson. What does an effective relationship between the board and superintendent look like and how do you cultivate such a relationship from the day that I get the, the good news call uh, if I'm your choice I'm gonna work as hard as I can to build relationships with all of you and to build to earn your trust I'm gonna work for all seven of you and I'm gonna work as hard as I can to ensure that you all have the information that you need to make the decisions that you're asked to make to govern the district. I don't think that I will have a higher priority with the exception of the safety and security of our students and our staff. Um, making sure that you're informed, making sure that you know what's going on, making sure that you have all the information you need, getting back to you, responding to you. And I think over time that's just gonna uh, engender uh, trust and build a relationship between us. Uh, I, I value transparency and I, I value sharing information. I, I think one of the big lessons I've learned working for our superintendent is how flexible you have to be. Some board members like to talk on the phone. Some board members like to stop by the office. Some board members text nowadays, which is a new phenomenon. Um, but I'm ready for all of that, and I'm ready to be accessible for all of that, and I'm ready to, to work for all of you. And, and I think that Something I'm really proud of, all seven members of the Warren Consolidated Schools Board of Education know who my kids are um, and, and, ask, and, and know them well enough to ask about them. And I know who their kids are too. And I know well enough to ask, and I know them well enough to ask about them by name. And so it's not just a working, it's, it's a relationship. And so that's what I'm gonna work and I'm gonna strive to cultivate that with all seven of you. Um, to get to know you, to let you get to know me, because I think that's where the best 
board superintendent relationships grow out of is if number one you feel like I'm working as hard as I can number two you feel well informed and you have everything you need and number three you feel like you can know me a little bit as a person you're gonna the seven of you are gonna trust me with an incredible responsibility and and I want to earn your trust and make sure that that you know that I'm working as hard as I can for all of you every day thank you our next question is from trustee mrs. Dunn I'm sorry. Oh, did I? Sorry. Yep, Mrs. Kaplan, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> How do you gain support for and educate the community about our schools, specifically when faced with a controversial topic like redistricting or privatization? Sure. So we, we've gone through the redistricting process. I, I mentioned to you we've closed an elementary school. The early childhood example comes back once more. Um, so I think that you know we, we and Warren kind of been through some of those big things, but I think it starts before that. So I, I think one of the things I admire about Wald Lake is your commitment to communication, your your, your social media footprint, uh, the way that you put information out there. It's it's credible and and I think it's responsible. And I, I like the fact that as a system, you even in some cases when you don't know the answer yet, you share the timeline. Right? We don't know what the snow day picture is going to be just yet, but we're monitoring it. Or you know, we don't know what this is going to look like, but this is what we're thinking and this is what we're monitoring. And that's something I've noticed about your district over a period of years. That's not a new phenomenon. So I think it starts with that ongoing regular communication. And I think it's, it's that steady drip of consistent quality information. And then I think it's it's also about cultivating relationships. I shared with you our faith-based community partners that, we, that I talked about where we bring them in every so often. Uh, we also have what we call our PTO sharing group where we have representatives from the PTO in every school in our district. We bring them together a couple of year, uh, times of year and we let them share kind of what different PTO organizations are doing and what they're thinking about. But we also share information with them to get their feedback and to listen to them. And the, the steady drip of information and then the cultivation of those relationships I think has helped us in those times where we've had to make some of those big moves. For example, during COVID when we had to move to a single platform to make it easier for everybody for remote learning, I'm sure you went through this too. When we selected that platform, we had the PTO sharing group come in and take a look at it and we had somebody present it and we had somebody sitting in the back of the room writing down everything that the PTO members were saying. And what happened there was you got a letter from our superintendent saying, this is what we've identified, this is how it works, this is what we're gonna do, and here's our opportunities for training for parents. But we also had our first wave of frequently asked questions that was populated by this group who we know knows us and we know will give us quality feedback. From there, every time we publish frequently asked questions, there's an email address. Ours is info at wcskids.net. And if you, in, if you email info at wcskids.net, it comes to me. And so uh, I, I then evaluate and update the FAQs. Um, so when you're going through those bigger times, I think if you've cultivated those relationships, at least to get the ball rolling on how you communicate, I don't think you can over communicate in those situations. You have to listen, you have to answer every question. Uh, we have a 24 hour rule. So if you call my office, I'll call you back within 24 hours uh, sometimes. Uh, especially during the pandemic where we were getting 30 calls a day. We had to be honest with people and say, it's going to be a couple of days, but we'll get back to you. Uh, you know, that, that's a hallmark of ours. So there's, there's the big ways where, you know, we cultivate relationships with these groups or we have our frequently asked questions documents or we push out content, but then there's little ways. And I think if you do a good job with your communication just on the day to day, I think it increases your credibility and I think makes those, those bigger communications a little bit more meaningful and I think a little bit more believable, right? Because I think everybody's looking for good, credible information these days. Thank you. Um, the next question is from tr Trustee Mrs. Dunn. Tell us what budget development process you use to gain broad support for the final result. So I, I came out in 2016, we were in the deficit. I shared that before. Um, and our CFO, she started a, a couple of days after I did. So we were new together. And it didn't take long to realize that our budget process was not where it needed to be. So we, we really didn't have the budget process that we needed for the size organization that we had. 
So we approached the superintendent, shared with him wh what our concerns were and the problems that were gonna result. It was gonna be harder to provide accurate budgets and that makes things harder for things like negotiations and it also makes it harder to project what we can and can't do, especially in the situation that we were in. So we were charged by our superintendent to go out and find and rework this. Now our CFO comes from the private sector, so she didn't have a network of colleagues in K-12 that she could call upon. So part of this fell to me. And so what I, what happened to work out was in, in doing the homework, the school district that we identified for the purpose of budget process was yours. So um, I have a professional relationship with Dr. Delgado. I have a professional relationship with Mr. Gutman. They were incredibly generous with their time uh, and talked to us. And so our budget development process mirrors yours. And there's a reason you win awards for your budget process. Um, because of the way that you start with your projections and the way that you start with your assumptions and that and Everybody starts with assumptions But the way you start with assumptions and the important way that you dig deep to make sure that you know I see it the way that you make sure that you know what you're doing and then the way you go to work on the communication So we we stole your idea um, But it, it's really worked well for us Thank you next question uh, trustee Ms. Van Leeuwen it's been said that people either love or hate negotiations in the school community. Would you please tell us where you fall on this spectrum and would you share with us your personal negotiating experiences? Sure. So I mentioned I've been on our negotiating team uh, for the past six years. Uh, in 2021, as we were working hard to try to figure out how to get kids back to school um, after we had that COVID spike around Thanksgiving and Christmas, uh, our superintendent came to me and said that we were about to have a shakeup in our HR office, and he asked me if I would be our chief negotiator, uh, which was a new experience for me. And so I was the chief negotiator with the Warren Education Association and the Warren Administrators Association. And just for some additional context, um, it was, if it's not the last pre-right-to-work contract, it was pretty close. So in 2013, our district and the Warren Education Association signed an eight-year agreement and that ended in 2021. So we, in January of 2021, had to go to work um, to renegotiate with our teachers. And I had to be the chief negotiator, which being on the team and leading the team, two very different experiences. And I think probably what helped, what helped me most was I had good relationships. I had good relationships with our union leaders. I had good relationships with our team. I had a great relationship with our, our district council who was really helpful and I was working really hard. But candidly, something that would take somebody with experience 45 minutes probably took me about three hours to get prepared. But I think people noted how hard I was working and my effort, which I think helped a little bit, but effort doesn't win ball games. And so we, we had to produce and we had to show results, and, and we did. I'm so pleased to report we got a two-year deal at the end of that w without any strife. We, we were able to work together to something that was fair for both sides. Uh, we were able to do that same thing. Our administrators don't have a Me Too clause, so we had to go to do the same work with the administrators, and we got a two-year deal with them too. Uh, and then we were able to come back a couple months later and take care of a few leftover issues and add a third year. Um, which I think will help us and, and I think stabilizes our labor environment for the next couple of years. Uh, we're anticipating some major turnover in Warren Con. So we had a couple of buyouts and those folks are getting close to that 30 year mark. And so we needed to do something to kind of stabilize the system. And I think that that was the right move at the time. So uh, serving as the chief negotiator was, was intense and it was a learning experience. I will tell you that I don't love negotiations, but I don't hate them either. Um, I really don't. I, I started to enjoy the work and I started to enjoy the process, especially when you can consider what it's going to mean for the district going forward. Thank you. Next question, uh, Trustee Mrs. Casagrande. You see, this is always perfect timing. He's taking his drink yeah, of water good work again, yeah. again, and I'm <laughs> yeah. finishing my notes. Perfect. So, okay. <laughs> so, Dr. Bernie, what do you foresee um, as items that a superintendent should do? versus delegate versus lead and please provide examples. Sure, I think I think a superintendent, I, I think it works best when the superintendent makes sure, when the superintendent is the one to provide the information to the board. 
uh, I make presentations to our board, I give memos to the superintendent to give to the board, but he controls that process to make sure the board gets what they need and they don't have things coming at them from all different angles. I think that works best for our system. I think that's a good way to operate. So I think, and that's not a, that's not a, a statement of ego or anything like that. I just think it's most efficient to make sure that you have the information that you need. So I think that is the superintendent's role. I think it's the superintendent's role to lead the cabinet, um, whether it's, whether it's how you uh, evaluate those folks or how you lead that group or how you uh, attract and, and hire and retain those folks. I, I think that's an important component of the superintendent. I think when a district communication goes out, I think it should have the superintendent's name on it. I, I think that's important. Uh, I think delegation, you know, I think superintendents should let their division leaders lead their divisions. I think they should let their principals lead their schools. I think you should be engaged and know what's going on, but I, I don't think that that, I think you should be hiring and recruiting leaders that can lead. And, and so as superintendent, uh, if I'm leading one of our divisions, something's gone wrong. And, and I don't think that's the right way to, I don't think that's the right way to approach it. And then I think the last piece of it is for people like me who want to be superintendent, you know, I'm here tonight because Dr. Robert Livernoy asked me what I wanted to do and he's given me considerable examples that I was able to talk about here that go beyond what you might see in a traditional chief academic officer. And I think that's an important role for a superintendent too, to build that next generation. Thank you. Uh, question from Vice President, Mr. Siegler. I'm sorry, excuse me, President Tyus, we have reached 55 minutes. Oh, we have? We have. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. You don't get to ask that question? I will leave it up. That, that is at your discretion, but we have hit 55 minutes. I don't okay. think you should answer the question. Anyone have? I do. Okay. Fine. Yeah. What unique skills or leverage could you bring to this position and how will Wildlife Consolidated Schools be served by this? Please provide examples of how you've leveraged these skills. All right, let, we'll, we'll make a lightning round version of this to make <laughs> yeah. Jay happy. Um, I, think, I think coming from a big district, you know, the, I, I, the footprint of Wild Lake, uh, coming from a district the size of Warren Consolidated Schools, which is very comparable to you, not only uh, in terms of buildings, in terms of students, but geographically, I, I think that is something that I bring to the table. I think that will will serve you well. I think I shared my my opportunity with the NASSP to travel the country. Uh, I'm, I'm also part of the Educational Research Development Institute. Uh, there's not a lot of people from Michigan that participate. It's a national group. Um, I've been invited to participate in a symposium with them in October. If if I'm here working with you, we'll see if it works in the schedule. If not. Um, I'll be here. But I, I think that uh, that national level or that national exposure, I think, brings you um, just kind of a picture of what it looks like around the country. So I, I not only have a good local network in Oakland County from my time here, uh, in Macomb County from my time there uh, at the state level, but also at the national level, I think that would serve you well. Uh, and then I think just on a, on a personal level, I, I'm, I strive to get better. I'm a learner who's very, very coachable and who's driven to improve. Uh, whether I'm here with you or I'm in Warren Consolidated Schools, I'm gonna have the best year of my whole career right here uh, coming up. And I'm committed to it. I'm committed to getting better every day. And so I think that'll serve you very, very well. Uh, that also pushes me to listen and pushing me to listen and being a listener and really trying to identify and respond to and solve the right problems of the district. I think um, I, have the, I have the bold I have the bold courage to take action when we identify something's not working. I have the I have the courage to do it, but when we identify that there's something that is working, I have the humility to leave it alone. Um, I'm not going to change things just for the sake of changing them, and so I, I think that that's just an important attribute I bring to the job. Okay, um, thank you. Um, as we wind down our time together here tonight, um, very quickly, would you like to leave us with any closing remarks or thoughts? I, I certainly want to thank you for the opportunity. I really enjoy being here uh, and getting to know you a little bit. Um, I did produce uh, a 90-day plan that I want to leave with you for your review so you can kind of think about how I um, see exactly and specifically how I'm thinking about getting started. I can give those to Jay to make sure that he gets them to you. Um, and, and again, uh, you know, thanks for the opportunity. This is hard work, um, and you're, you're staying up late. Um, and, and so I really do appreciate it. Uh, I do uh, – I just want to close um, – just quite simply, I, I was driving over here. I was driving over here tonight, and I was thinking about the path I took to get here, because um, this is such an honor 
you know, to have, to have been here and to, to interview in such an incredible system and an incredible district. Uh, and, you know, in thinking about that path and in thinking about how I got here, um, you know, I, I got into education because my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, suggested that it would be a good idea, and I'm here now. And so I, I, she's up late watching this. Um, our kids are probably up late too. They're not going to bed yet. Uh, and uh, and I, I just uh, before I close out in front of everybody here, um, you know, she's she's just been so supportive of me and in my leadership journey and everything that um, she's been a, a critical friend and and pushed me sometimes and encouraged me and been patient and sacrificed a lot for me to be here. And so I want to take this public forum to close out, uh, in addition to thanking you, uh, to, to thank my wife, Jennifer, who is uh, an incredible human being. And uh, yeah, that's where I want to leave it tonight. Good luck with the rest of your search. I'm sorry I played overtime. Jay is going to sh shame me on the way out of the building. And uh, enjoy the rest of your night. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Well, thank you very much, um, Dr. Vernia. We appreciate your interest uh, in our superintendent position. And uh, the, the board is interviewing a number of candidates, and we will contact you if you are selected as a finalist. Thank you very much for your time this evening, and um, thank you. Again, I encourage our um, participants here in the audience tonight to um, complete their feedback forms, and then um, um, please turn them in to, um, um, to Mrs. Sovel or to Mr. Bennett.